Okay, um, so welcome everybody to this week's CEN seminar. It is with great pleasure I can introduce our speaker today, who is Professor John Coleman. John is a clinical psychologist and emeritus professor at the University of Bedfordshire. And he has been looking at uh, the neuroscience perspective on the adolescent brain and how that information might be useful for secondary school teachers, for parents, and of course, for the children themselves. He's written a book, The Teacher and the Teenage Brain, pulling all his work together. And it includes workshop lesson plans for teachers, parents, and children um, to learn about the teenage brain. The publisher of the book actually approached our very own Professor Michael Thomas to um, write a review. And I won't read the review to you because you can buy the book and read it yourself. But what he did say about it was that one of the main points for him was that John believes that disseminating information to interested parties on how the teen brain works is more important than advocating for specific teaching implications. So his argument is leave that up to the um, practitioners. So we're looking forward to John talking today to us about how neuroscience can make a difference to schools, to parents and to young people. And John, I believe that at the end, you welcome lots of discussion and questions, correct? Absolutely. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Rebecca. So I will hand over to you now. Thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, good afternoon, everyone. And um, it's great to um, uh, see that there's uh, a large group of people and I'm really looking forward to talking to you. Um, and I hope that we can have a, a discussion about this because uh, there are lots of challenging issues in what I'm going to talk about. Um, I've called this how neuroscience can make a difference to schools, to parents and to young people. Um, uh, this is the book that Rebecca talked about, um, and I'm going to obviously be drawing on what's in the book uh, today. Um, I think this has become known as translational science. Um, I think when I was really working on this project, which I should say has taken about eight years, I think I started in about 2013, um, we, it was more like people were talking about public engagement with science, um, but the, the term translational science seems to have uh, uh, become quite popular now. And it is, I feel, very important, and it's very important for me um, and I think that probably my career, which is a bit of a checkered career, may have something to do with it. As Rebecca said, I trained as a clinical psychologist, but I've done lots of different things. I've had two long stints uh, in academia, um, the most recent one being in the Department of Education at Oxford. Um, but I've also um, run a special school for troubled young people, and I've also been a civil servant. Um, so I worked in the Department of Health as a policy advisor, and that was uh, quite a quite an experience. Um, so I, I've been in all these different settings, and, and I think that's just really encouraged me um, uh, to see how important it is that uh, for those of us who do research, particularly in areas like, like neuroscience, to think about how that information, that knowledge can be used uh, in other settings is just so very important. So how did all this start? Um, so I said uh, that it was, uh, it's probably about eight, nine years that it's been going. And what happened was that the Director of Children's Services in Hertfordshire had um, heard me speaking and my background is essentially uh, young people, adolescents, and I've written lots about adolescents and so on. And um, in Hertfordshire, they had been developing a program uh, about the early years, the brain and the early years, they called it my baby's brain. And it had been very successful. They'd rolled it out for their own staff, but also for parents. And they wanted to sort of do the next thing, as it were, and they wanted to focus on, on the teen brain. They called it my teen brain. And they asked me if I would help them um, to develop, first of all, a workshop for practitioners, as you can see here. So that was social workers, youth workers, and so on. And from that, and that has been very successful, um, uh, and it's still running uh, uh, seven or eight years later. And um, the interesting thing about it was not that, not just that the practitioners found this really important and they felt that it changed their practice, this knowledge, but that 
uh, they started to ask whether this isn't, wasn't something that should be uh, available to others. And particularly, um, I suppose the first question was really about schools. Why weren't schools receiving this? Um, uh, teachers, uh, but also uh, young people themselves. And then also parents, you know, surely parents should be getting this. So um, essentially the project um, evolved and uh, we uh, and my colleagues uh, moved from just doing the uh, workshop uh, for practitioners to doing these other things. And what I want to talk about today is primarily the work in schools and the lesson plan that I've developed for students. I mean, there's lots more to say. Um, uh, 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 it's in the book, of course, um, but I thought, obviously, we haven't got a, a, a huge amount of time. I thought I'd concentrate um, on the um, lesson plan for students. I think that um, has been probably the most challenging bit of the work, but also the most uh, fascinating and, and rewarding. And the big question is, how do you deliver it to students? So when the commissioners uh, in Hertfordshire and I should say other local authorities got really interested in this, there was a big debate about, well, wh what, what, what are we doing? Um, what's the rationale um, for uh, trying to um, develop materials for um, students? Uh, is it to complement the science curriculum, uh, the GCSE biology? Um, is it to help students understand themselves better? In other words, sort of some sort of idea of developmental psychology for young people. Um, is it to reduce mental health problems in school? And this was a really, so sort of 2015, 2016, some of you may remember, there's huge uh, public concern about mental health uh, for adolescents, for teenagers, and um, a number of the commissioners saw this as a way of reducing mental health problems. Or, and others who are concerned with um, um, offending behavior and so on thought it might reduce risk taking. Now, all of you can see, <laughs> I'm sure that one lesson is not going to do that. Um, but of course it raised the question for me of, well, what, it, you have to have a clear objective if you're developing uh, a, a curriculum. So there were many questions that had to be addressed here. Um, uh, could you put together uh, material that would be suitable for a classroom lesson. Who should deliver it? I was going to pilot it, but who who should who, who should deliver it once I, I was no longer there? What is the best age for it to be delivered? Um, how to engage students with something that in a way was a one-off but might be linked with PSHE or something like that? And as far as I knew, um, and I'd be very interested if any of the audience today can uh, point me to other people who've done similar things. Um, there is one other example, which I'll, I'll come to um, uh, in a minute. Um, but as far as certainly as I was developing it, as far as I knew, nothing similar had been done. Um, but there was huge enthusiasm, particularly in schools. I think, uh, you know, uh, I've Talk to so many teachers, head teachers, senior leadership team people, and uh, yeah, there were, uh, people saw it as very important. But of course, there were all these questions. So the challenges were: how do you get the key messages into a forty-five minute lesson? And um, of course, it often isn't. Certainly, if you're visiting a school, often it isn't just a forty-five minute lesson because they troop in a bit late or the the room that you've been allocated, <laughs> someone else uh, has already in there or, or whatever. Um, so, uh, you know, how do you package it? And I have to say that um, in all the work that I've done subsequently, most people believe that 45 minute lesson isn't sufficient to do this. Um, but the commissioners felt that if I didn't do it like this, then schools wouldn't, wouldn't pick it up. Got to make it interesting, you've got to engage the students, you've got to address the objectives, going back to the objectives, find a way of making it worthwhile for schools and design a set of materials that others would want to teach. So all these things, uh, and I 
was not someone who um, uh, you know, had expertise in curriculum design. I worked closely with uh, the PSHE Association colleagues there. Um, and also I had huge help from across the spectrum of, of neuroscience. So uh, Sarah Jane Blakemore, um, a name you will all no doubt know, uh, Paul Howard Jones in Bristol, um, uh, and uh, many books, not many, but uh, quite a few books were written about um, the adolescent brain, the teenage brain, in the sort of period 2015 to 2018. So Adriana Galvan in California, um, uh, um, uh, Francis Jensen, uh, still um, uh, very, a book very widely used here and so on. So lots of challenges, as you can see, um, uh, but, uh, there was a lot of interest and I was being commissioned to, to do this. Um, so uh, obviously today, uh, you know, I won't, I won't have the time to um, uh, go through all the materials with you. There are quite a lot of materials, so there's a, a tutor pack um, which helps the, the tutors to go through the materials. Um, there are a set of slides. Um, there's a student pack which they all get, which has the activities in, uh, and there's lots of other um, sort of exercises and activities which are which are optional in a way so there's quite a lot of stuff and um, I, I did say to Rebecca at the beginning um, you know if anyone wants to contact me afterwards and, and uh, you know have further discussion about this I'd obviously be delighted um, I'm, I'm working with a number of schools at the moment there has does seem to be a lot of interest and um, you know I, I have to be acknowledge gratitude to the PSHE Association and also to the other trainers. Um, so a charity, some of you may know, called Family Links in Oxford, um, their trainers have been working with me because obviously I, could, I wouldn't be able to deliver to all the audiences that I've, de I've described. So what I thought I'd do just to give you a sort of sense of it is just to um, uh, run through the, the overall lesson plan. Um, and uh, I should say that in the end, uh, the decision was seen to be that year nine was the most appropriate place for this in the, in the school in the years. Um, I have run, run it with year seven and eight. I've run it with years 12 and 13. Um, uh, and it's been different, of course, in, in, with different ages. But I think most teachers seem to think that year nine is, is a good year. Um, it's uh, a time when there's a lot of impact on young people of the, all the changes um, that are taking place, uh, the, um, the mood swings, the, um, the sort of... Um, uh, ups and downs, the meltdowns and so on are very present. They're, obviously, there's the physical changes associated with puberty. Um, and teachers seem to think that if you do it much later, so by year 10 or, or, or certainly 11, that preoccupation with GCSE, of course. Uh, and the older ones, I've had lovely times with, and I've got to do um, sixth form um, in a couple of weeks. Um, I've had lovely times with older ones, um, particularly uh, A-level psychology students, but they all say, we should have had this much earlier, you know, um, uh, this, this would have been so helpful uh, at an earlier stage. So what I did was, um, uh, and this is the, the outline, so, learning objectives so make it clear to them at the beginning what, what we're trying to aim to do and we don't say stop your risk taking or anything like that but we do say it's about understanding yourself better helping you um, in your relationships with others uh, but most important it's helping you to understand a little bit about what's happening to you during these years. Um, uh, so to engage students I developed some this true or false quiz so I've got a whole lot of statements, um, some of which are true, some of which are false, um, which gets the class started because they have to answer whether it's true or false. So things like um, when you go to sleep, your brain goes to sleep too, true or false. Um, the brain is in two halves. There's a bridge in the middle, true or false. Um, the brain has close to 100 billion neurons, those sorts of things. And then it sort of starts the discussion. But the, the important thing about the true or false quiz is that they're all issues that I'm going to come back to later. Um, so it starts people thinking about the structure of the brain, um, uh, the things like memory and sleep and so on. 
And then, and this is, I suppose, the most, the central bit, well, one of the central bits anyway, which is basically outlining what changes during these years. So uh, I, I outline um, the, 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 the maturation of the brain. Um, I outline the increased connectivity between the two hemispheres. I talk about um, pruning. Uh, uh, synaptic pruning, and I talk about um, uh, the uh, impact of hormone and hormone variation, um, and I select a few key hormones like dopamine, for example, and melatonin, which have an impact, a direct impact on, on behaviour. And then uh, you can't do this without doing learning and memory, of course. So, and, and one of the things that students very frequently ask is how would this help me with revision? And so I talk a little bit about how learning takes place, the role of the hippocampus, um, uh, short-term and long-term memory. And we talk about things that can help them with revision. And then uh, stress and emotion. Um, uh, so I was, uh, I was very, I felt very challenged about how to deal with the mental health issue. And I was quite clear that in one lesson, you can't, you simply can't, you know, raise questions that, that are going to leave the students with um, uh, anxieties or worries or raising um, questions that, that might be troubling for them. So, um, but I thought that uh, I could talk about stress and um, which I do and about and coping because a lot in the literature, as you probably know about coping in adolescence, lots of ways you can talk about coping that's helpful, coping that's not so helpful, and so on. And I've got a, a coping question or a set of questions asking them to think about what they do under certain circumstances, um, what sort of things they do when they're under stress and so on. So I don't, I, I keep it fairly um, uh, at this sort of level. Um, uh, we don't talk about serious mental health issues. It's not a, a lesson on mental health, but that seemed to me at least to address some of the issues and to help students uh, think a bit about how they could manage their own uh, stress and, and emotional states. And then um, uh, neuroplasticity, uh, what you can do to keep your brain healthy, something about the impact of the environment and things they themselves can do, like getting more oxygen to the brain and so on. So that's the, that's the outline. Now, um, uh, I, I thought that I'd just uh, share one little one element with you. Um, and as I say, please get in touch if you want to know more. And there is a website associated with the book, which has all the slides and everything. So I, um, this is my change questionnaire. And uh, what happened, I had a sort of a moment of epiphany. I was standing up in front of the class and I was telling them, uh, these are the changes that are happening in your brain. And I suddenly thought, I'm standing here telling them what the changes are. Does anyone ever ask them what changes they're experiencing? So I thought, I really need to address that. So I developed this change questionnaire, and this is just uh, the beginning of it, and, and it's terribly simple. So all they have to do is, it's entitled Change Since You Became a Teenager, and all they have to do is just to circle one of these. So do they think their memory is better or worse? Do they think they're more or less moody? And so on. And there are only 10 items, so it doesn't take very long. But all these things, of course, are absolutely critical for understanding the brain. And so I can then feed back to them what other um, young people like themselves think. And also I pick out the things that are um, uh, sort of universal, if you like, and things that aren't so. So the three things that are all agreed by almost all is that they are more moody, they are more stressed, and they have more difficulty getting to sleep. Those are the things that over 80%, and I've, I've got about 500 um, uh, uh, completed change questionnaires. So uh, uh, I've got a, a reasonable sense of, of what, um, uh, you know, what they, how they respond. Now, this is all pre-COVID, of course. I haven't done it um, since the pandemic started. So that's something we may want to talk about later. Um, but this is the sort of thing that I've introduced to make the, the lesson plan interactive to make it um, uh, really engaging. And if this sort of thing, I mean, you could spend half an hour talking about the responses because you can ask them um, uh, what they mean when they say their memory is, is worse. 
Um, or and one of the things is, uh, uh, since I've changed, since you became a teenager, it's easier to talk to parents or harder to talk to parents. You're more influenced by friends or less influenced by friends, or even sleep. You know, it's harder to get to sleep, easier to get to sleep. Why are they saying it's harder to get to sleep? What's going on for them? And you, you can have a, a question, uh, you know, a really good discussion. I've, I've uh, also said to many, many people, you can use this in one-to-one in -one work. Um, you can use it in the family. Um, because of course it just opens up such an interesting discussion with young people they're not asked normally they're not asked this sort of thing and it, it helps them to reflect it also helps them to think through um uh, what what they're experiencing and i mean one of the things is stress well, i could spend quite a lot of time talking about stress um uh, so 95 percent of teenagers say they're more stressed since they became a teenager and you'll be interested what perhaps won't be surprised but you'd be interested to know what is the big stressor what is the thing that is most stressful for teenagers and almost everyone says it's school it's pressure from teachers it's homework it's revision it's tests it's all that pressure pressure from parents also about what how, what's going you know how you're managing how you're put what your performance is like um, and that's really really significant and again I mean we could have a whole session talking about that and talking about stress um, but again you know it just opens up a whole um, opportunity for um, uh, for a wide-ranging discussion with students and I was working with the school um, just uh, late last week and um, they're actually going to as a result of this they're going to uh, design a whole um, lesson about stress and coping and um, and get them really to talk about it. Okay, um, so uh, conscious of the time. Now, uh, what I'm going to do for the, the rest of the session is that uh, I'm going to take um, the questions. Now, there's someone called Annie Brookman Byrne. Uh, I don't know if any of you know her. She did um, her PhD at Birkbeck, and she is currently the deputy editor of The Psychologist. And she interviewed me um, about the book and about my work around on the teenage brain. And in the December issue of The Psychologist, your, it, the, um, uh, the interview is, uh, is published. So what I thought I'd do, and just is, I'm using it as a prompt really, um, is to talk, uh, I'm just gonna take four questions, not all the questions she asked, but four questions um, that she asked, which I, were great questions, uh, just as a way of um, encouraging you to think more about this and hopefully provoke some discussion. So, question number one that Annie asked, people focus on the changes in the brain and they tend to focus on the negative consequences of, of what's happening, of the changes in the brain. Um, so, uh, like risk taking, but what about the positives? And for me, that's a great question because um, I see this time of life, this stage, as du a duality in the sense that both very positive things are happening and some more challenging things. I often say when I uh, give lectures is that inside every teenager is both a child and an adult. Um, so you've got the adult that's pushing for independence and maturity and wants to be grown up and so on, but you've also got the child inside. So you see this sometimes this uh, uh, childish behavior, this dependent behavior, even infantile behavior. Um, and so you see this, it's a paradox. And parents and many adults, professional adults, teachers find this very puzzling and confusing because you don't know quite where you stand, you don't know how to respond and so on. And I think it's absolutely fascinating because this duality is, of course, reflected exactly um, in the brain, in what's happening in the brain. So the brain is maturing. Um, and so you're getting all sorts of positive changes, uh, particularly around um, uh, the prefrontal cortex, of course, and the, um, uh, all the cognitive skills, the reasoning, the problem solving, the scientific thinking, um, uh, and so on, uh, which is all of which is underpinned by that maturation that's occurring. Um, and you've got greater connectivity, of course. So, um, you know, two hemispheres are working better together. You've got uh, uh, um, maturing myelin uh, around the nerve fiber. All those things are leading to mat maturational processes. But on the other hand, you've also got pruning 
um, which is leading to a, quite a significant restructuring and reorganization uh, and a significant loss of, of gray matter. Um, and you've also got the, the impact of hormones, the variation in hormones, which um, uh, affects uh, the, uh, the way in which moods and, and emotion regulation and so on are occurring. So I thought that, um, you know, uh, Annie's question was absolutely right. And, and I think very important for um, uh, young people to understand. And, oh, someone's got a, a dog. If you could mute, your, mute yourself, please. Um, very important to understand what I call the duality, or if you like, the paradox. Why is adolescence so puzzling? It is because you get both happening. And how is it possible that, uh, you know, a young person, a 14 or 15 year old can at the one time um, be so mature and sensible and helpful and at the other be so egocentric and self-absorbed and so on, all that sort of thing, which I know many of you will be familiar with. But what I think is so important is that that is uh, reflected in what is happening in, in the in the brain. So the changes, which in the end, of course, are leading to a, a, a much more mature functioning individual, um, are during this period uh, um, leading to some challenges. And obviously there are, uh, you know, huge individual differences. Sarah Jane Blakemore has been highlighting um, some of the individual differences in terms of pruning, you know, that, that uh, uh, different sites um, experience pruning in different ways and different individuals have more or experience more or less pruning and so on. So, you know, we have to be very careful about generalizing, but on the whole, um, you know, basically you're getting some very positive movement, but you're also getting um, some challenges. Okay, so this is a big one too. Is there any danger in encouraging teachers to use an understanding of neuroscience in their teaching? Neuromyths, says Annie, are still very much present. And I, I, this is such a big one. And I know, you know, Michael Thomason and other colleagues at Birkbeck UCL have written about this. So the first question is, you know, is it premature to be teaching this sort of thing, uh, to be sharing this sort of knowledge? Are, are we not ready for it? And a number of people have written uh, about the fact that it's just premature because, you know, we're learning so much. Uh, neuroscience is such an, at such an early stage and so on. So first of all, is it premature? The second thing is, um, what use is it in education? And I mean, that I know that's, <laughs> that's what you're all concerned with. Um, Paul Howard Jones in Bristol wrote a very nice article, and I, I wished I'd thought of the title myself. And the title of the article is From Brain Scan to Lesson Plan. Some of you may know the article. Um, well, of course, <laughs> you know, he wrote it uh, tongue in cheek because you can't go from brain scan to lesson plan. And one of the important things, I think, is that, um, uh, you know, the, the new the knowledge that we now have about the changes in the teenage brain don't necessarily help us with lesson planning or curriculum design. But that doesn't mean that they are, aren't really important. And one of the things I've done, because I've been sort of trying to address this issue, is that I've asked teachers, I've got a questionnaire, and I asked teachers, imagine this is before they do my workshop, I should say. Um, imagine that you're going to go to a workshop on the teenage brain. What sort of things would you like to, to know? What you would you like to cover? And of course, what people say is not, I want help with my lesson planning. What they say is I'd like to understand my students better. So why are, they, why are some students drowsy in the morning? Um, you know, why, uh, why do students mature at such different rates? Um, how can you, I love this question, how can you get in touch with the reasoning side of a teen's brain? Um, how can I help students understand consequences better? All those sorts of things, which of course are absolutely central for managing a classroom, but they're not lesson planning. So that's you know, and, and I talk a lot about this in the book, that that's what teachers want to know and that's what they, they don't get in their training. I think we, we are going back to initial teacher training here. Um, they simply don't get any of this sort of thing. So I, I think that, um, uh, you know, the, um, yes, neuromyths are very much present, but 
I think that if you're quite clear that you're concentrating on the absolutely central findings, the findings that you will find in any reputable textbook um, that all reputable scientists agree about, uh, and I think it's worth you know, making that point, um, then I think it's quite clear this changes teachers and students' understanding of themselves. Um, sorry, young people's understanding of themselves, and it changes teachers' ways in which they relate. So after the workshop, teachers will say things like, um, you know, I I, 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 I thought of my teaching. I, um, I don't uh, teach, I don't talk to students in quite the same way. I feel more sympathetic, um, those sorts of things. So it changes the way um, that teachers and students relate. Just absolutely central. Are the simple changes that teachers can make in the classroom that draw on the evidence from neuroscience? Um, and the answer is yes, there are a lot of things. So I, I'm gonna pick three now. Uh, so I think the first thing is reward processing. I think that the role of dopamine and the fact that uh, reward is so important for young people because of dopamine and because of the way those um, sites in the brain, like the nucleus accumbens and the uh, ventral striatum, um, uh, you know, are very active and affected by dopamine. The fact is that young people process rewards in a slightly different way. Rewards uh, play a very big part in the way the brain functions. Um, and uh, this is fairly recent. There are a number of people are writing about this at the moment, particularly Adriana Galvan in California, um, but, but others too. And so I think understanding uh, reward processing and, and thinking about how the school structures its rewards and its criticisms, uh, its praise and its criticisms and so on, really can make a difference. Second thing I think is about sleep. Now, teachers don't know that, um, you know, a good proportion of young people, of students, still have melatonin in their brains at, let's say, nine o'clock in the morning. Um, uh, and, and on the whole, adults don't. So um, knowing that, of course, has big implications. Why are students, some students drowsy in the morning? And I think, you know, school, schools have to think about this because if you're doing a tests and exams, early in the morning, first thing in the morning, some students are being disadvantaged. So I think schools have had to face up to this. And so I think that's the second thing, really thinking about um, the whole issue of sleep um, and how um, we manage the school day in relation to the first and second lessons. So there's a lot more to say about sleep, of course. And then the third thing is executive function. You all, and I'm sure, know about executive function. But uh, one of the things I think I've certainly found that teachers find very, very interesting is just understanding, you know, something that underlies the cognitive maturation that's going on. So things like working memory, the inhibitory process. See, I don't think that you know, teachers have thought a lot about this, but how the brain functions and how inhibi inhibition um, impacts on the way you pay attention, you concentrate in class and so on, how you can help students understand the inhibitory process, all that's very, very important. So uh, I would say, you know, three things there um, uh, that, that uh, I think uh, uh, could, could really help um, and, and make changes. So uh, reward processing, uh, understanding sleep and executive function. There are probably, there are many others, of course, but um, I just uh, highlight those, I think. Okay, so um, uh, then this is the last one. Um, what challenges did you face in designing these workshops? And I, I've obviously said something about this. I think that um, the, the, there are still big questions about um, where this material fits in the curriculum, how we can help teachers to feel confident. So training with trainers um, is very important. So how can we help teachers feel um, confident about this? Um, and I think, you know, um, encouraging schools to see how important it is. Uh, and, and my view is that it, it's really good uh, if schools can not just focus on the lesson plan for the students, I think that they, uh, it, it's really good if the teachers themselves 
and not just the ones who are going to deliver this stuff, but teachers generally know a bit more about the brain because this is, this is definitely going to help them in thinking about managing the school and so on. And I think engaging parents because we all know um, that schools do feel they've got some responsibility to help uh, parents understand their, their uh, uh, sons and daughters. Um, but what they do is they, um, you know, organize a, an evening session on sex or drugs and only a handful turn up. My experience and the experience of the local authorities I've worked with and the school, the academy chains, is that you get a much, much higher attendance um, if you offer a workshop on the teenage brain. I mean, I've had, uh, when I've been doing it pre-COVID, I've done a bit uh, online since, but mainly it was um, most of what I did was pre-COVID. We were getting 100, 150 parents turning up in, 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 for an evening session. And they go away saying, you know, this is, this is, this is, um, you know, this is like a light bulb moment. I hadn't thought about this. I had no idea my teenager's brain was changing in this way. I simply didn't know. And I won't be the same. You know, I won't talk to them in the same way. I mean, it does really change um, people's, uh, the, the way people see uh, this age group. It, it's fundamental. Um, OK, so um, I'm going to come to a conclusion so that we can have some time for questions. Before I do this, I just want to say that I did say that I didn't know of anything else like this. Um, and that that is true when we started. Um, I have come across one other project, um, which is sort of it's not quite the same. But it's um, a project that was developed in Oxford by the Department of Psychiatry there. And it's called the Myriad Project. And anyone who wants um, a link, I can obviously let them have that. Um, it, it, it's very different from what I'm talking about. It's um, uh, what they've done is they've used it as, as part of research. And um, they've got they've used a number of tests like um, uh, uh, a risk taking test, a um, delay of gratification test uh, and, and so on. So. Uh, it's 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 more a set of tests. There, there's some background um, material. There's some slides. As far as I know, it, it isn't being used in schools. Um, I, I tried to find out more when I was finishing my book because I wanted to put something about the Miriam project, Mir project in. Um, but I think that uh, it doesn't really seem to be happening very much. There, you, you can dig around online and find a little bit about it. Um, but I, I should acknowledge that. Um, so it's important to say that. But I, I haven't come across anything else. So um, please do get in touch with me if, if you do know anyone who's doing anything similar, because obviously I, I'd really, really love to, um, uh, to hear about that and to acknowledge it and, and to work with other people on this. OK, so to conclude, right, so um, as I say, it, it's, it's been hugely rewarding for me, it's been challenging, but it's been hugely rewarding. I think that for young people, and, and I'm, because adolescence is my field, I spend a lot of time talking to young people and working with young people, um, it's fascinating to see how reassuring it is. I, uh, they simply don't know this, and they don't understand why they have these meltdowns, they don't understand why they get so stroppy with their parents, they don't understand um, why they don't think about the consequences that they just say, I didn't think. Um, and so to learn a little bit, I mean, it, it's just fundamental, it's human development, isn't it? So that's the first thing, and I'd like to do a lot more of that. It definitely changes the way teachers work with students. Um, so uh, I sort of quoted a few things, uh, you know, it changes, it, it, you just have a different understanding um, uh, and I think particularly, well, there are a number of things. I think the, con the whole idea of the understand, you know, helping them understand consequences, um, but also the meltdowns. And, and that's what teachers really, you know, emotion regulation. Why, why, aren't, why can't they deal with their emotions better? And helping students with that are just so important. And 
as I've said, for parents, it, it, it just, uh, it really does change relationships. And I've had that, I mean, this is a slight aside, but I've had that during COVID um, because I found myself working with families where there were real problems and just talking a little bit about this and helping parents think through how that, that these changes in the brain might affect behavior have, has really helped. It, it really, really helped. So, okay, so there's a long way to go. As you all know, neuroscience is still, um, quote unquote, in its infancy. And I mean, I have, even over these few years, I've had to change the material in the workshops constantly because of uh, new findings, um, uh, new work. I mean, uh, you know, uh, reward processing is a good example. Sleep, we've had, um, you know, much more, um, uh, many more findings uh, about uh, sleep and sleep and teenagers, um, but lots of other things too. Um, I'm very interested in puberty and how physical puberty correlates with uh, uh, the change, you know, the uh, developments in the brain. Um, that's something that's really only just on the horizon now. So there's a, there's a long way to go, but I do feel that you know, the fundamental things that I've talked about, um, for example, the main changes that occur during these years um, do, do change the way people understand uh, that this, this, uh, this stage of human development. And I suppose, you know, I do hope others will, will take on this, this, this challenge. It's different from being, uh, you know, a, a, an academic in a research setting different from working in a brain imaging lab i know um but uh you know it's one of the things i think that um uh people like ourselves social scientists um should be doing should be thinking about how we can uh really uh um help people um and use our knowledge to 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 encourage um a greater knowledge of of human development so thank you very much um i will stop there and uh, I'll stop sharing my slides and uh, hopefully we will have some discussion. I, I'm sure I've raised quite a lot of questions. So I'll stop sharing now. Okay, hello everyone. Thank you so much, John, for an excellent talk. Really, really interesting. Um, if people do have questions, you can either put them in the chat or you can raise your virtual hand, put your uh, video on and ask directly. Um, does anybody have? I think Natasha had her hand, is that right, Natasha? No, no. <laughs> no, she was giving you applause. Oh, um, oh applause. thank you. <laughs> yeah, yes. Um, while people are sort of formulating their questions, I, I will ask one, if that's okay. Oh, no, there's somebody beat me to it. Um, so Joe has asked, what one piece of advice would you give teachers? Well, I mean, I really, really would encourage teachers to learn more about this, this topic, this, this knowledge. Now, teachers, of course, are um, uh, not necessarily going to read a book. Um, and as we know, um, so much today uh, is online. So uh, one of the things that I do say to teachers is, you know, if you want to sort of start um, learning a little bit about this, go to a TED talk. Um, Sarah Jane Blakemore's got, um, got more than one TED talk now, and there are other TED talks, and that's a great way of starting, um, uh, you know, the, the, your sort of, uh, um, if you like, progress in learning about this. Um, uh, but uh, the other thing I would say is encourage your colleagues, um, uh, see if you can uh, find out, uh, find someone who can come into the school and help your colleagues and students uh, learn about this. Um, I suppose in terms of if, if the question is about one piece of uh, advice in terms of the teaching setting, uh, I, it's, it's difficult, isn't it? I, I mean, um, teachers have found different aspects of this fascinating. So some teachers say, you know, I didn't know there were so many neurons in the human brain. How does that actually work? And then others say, pruning? I mean, is it really true that 17% of the grey matter uh, is lost? How, how, to, how does that work? And then others say, I honestly didn't, you know, I, I see my students drowsy in the morning, and I never knew why that was. I thought they were just being difficult. Um, and I think the whole school should change 
um, you know, change it, it, its thinking about the way the, the timetable works. So, you know, there are, there are lots of different ways, I think, in that this knowledge can be used. So I, I think it's difficult to, um, uh, you know, to give one thing. I think different teachers will find different things useful. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, sort of uh, um, uh, emotional upsets, I think are, are, are very tricky for teachers, um, but there are other things too, you know, um, uh, the impact of the peer group, uh, uh, worries about risk-taking, uh, um, not paying, you know, um, attention and um, um, the, the sorts of things to do with uh, inhibitory processes, all those things. So uh, it's, it's uh, I'm sorry if I haven't answered it uh, as, as you hoped, but as you can see, as an all, there's a range of things and different teachers I think will, will need will need different things. But I've been very struck by the sleep thing. Um, and as I said, I've just been working with a couple of schools where they're actually going to, well, first of all, they're going to introduce sleep lessons or sleep, some people call them sleep, sleep hygiene lessons um, into school um, starting in January. And they're also going to change the timetable. Um, and you think, gosh, well, there's a, <laughs> that's, a, that's a good start because some of those students are really disadvantaged in the morning. So, yeah, all sorts of things come out of this. I hope that's a, a reasonable answer for you, Jo. Um, so we now have questions coming in thick and fast, as I knew they would. A, a couple of people saying, how do we contact you? Can we have an email address? We can deal with that at the end. That's fine. Um, Zara has, has asked about the recommendation that school should start later in the day for teenagers. We already have your thoughts on that. Well, um, uh, can, uh, Rebecca, can I just say something about that? Because that, that is very interesting. I, I don't, okay, so the Wellcome Trust before pre-pandemic offered a um, hundred schools, uh, asked for a hundred schools in the UK be willing to have a delayed start. And uh, how many do you think took it up? One. Really? Schools don't want to go down that route. And the reason they don't want to go down that route is partly because of the parents, because if you're working or you've got younger children or whatever, but teachers don't like it either because it, it's just so difficult. It is happening in the US in different states, um, but it's different there because schools start so much earlier. Um, I, uh, there's a lot to say about that. So I don't think there is there is any evidence here that schools are delaying their start. What they are doing is thinking about the schools I just mentioned, is changing the, the timetable so that they don't have tests and exams and things in the more in that, that early stage. So they find other things to do. Um, and so students aren't disadvantaged in terms of their performance. So that, that's what I meant. Thank you. Um, we've got so many questions coming. I'm not sure if we're going to get them all, to all of them, but we will try. Um, somebody has asked, Paul has asked whether you've quantified the impact of these workshops on the schools for students and teachers. Good question. I should have mentioned that. Um, the answer is no. And um, I think that's partly, well, it is partly funding, of course. Um, and it's also uh, a bit to do with me. I, I although I have got this uh, uh, very nice um, uh, relationship with the University of Bedfordshire. I'm no longer in you know, a full-time academic post. Um, and I've spent so much time really developing this stuff. I absolutely agree. I, I would love to see it evaluated. Um, I've talked to a couple of local authorities about this, but it, it just not, not something you know, that they would normally fund. So I think you know, it would be, um, a, a, a research funder, Wellcome Trust, possibly, um, possibly the SRC, um, and uh, I, I mean it, it's you know it's it's sort of next on the list as it were. I think it's essential, and uh, I have to be honest with you, uh, I haven't had the resources or time um, to do it, but I would love to see it done, and I, I think it, it is the next stage, of course. Thank you. We have another question from Daniel um, talking about initial teacher training and the new early careers framework that does address neuroscience to a degree. Um, have you found that, that teachers in schools are actually in a position to, to act on or to deliver, as Paul puts it, as Daniel puts it, deliver this? Do they have the knowledge to do so? And do you think it goes far enough? Very good question, Daniel. Um, 
Yes, I've been very concerned about this because um, uh, it's sort of around confidence, isn't it, about this is new material. Um, and uh, pre-COVID, I was running workshops in local authorities for groups of teachers, sometimes had 25, 30 teachers coming. Um, and there was a huge variation. And some people sort of um, just felt that it, it, they, they didn't, they were worried about the students asking questions they wouldn't be able to answer. Um, they, it was out of their comfort zone. Whereas others were just, yes, you know, absolutely. I had this wonderful um, teacher who actually came to one of the very early um, uh, workshops, which was for pra practitioners. And she just got, you know, she went back to her school, she developed an assembly um, around the brain, um, and uh, she used this wonderful phrase, she, she did the assembly, which had, you know, a little bit of a film and a sort of uh, a little bit of a TED talk and so on. And then she said to her students, right, students, off you go and beef up your prefrontal cortex. Um, <laughs> and I just love that. Um, and and I've, I've met lots of teachers who, you know, have just embraced this. So I think it varies. I mean, my experience in Oxford um, was that it was very difficult to get anything really on human development into, into the curriculum um, because there's still so much preoccupation in the secondary curriculum with teaching your subject. Um, in, the, uh, in primary, it's different, but in secondary, it still is very tricky. Um, and there is that culture really that, that you're there to learn how to teach history or maths or whatever. Um, I, it, it is true that there is some change and there's a little bit of neuroscience now coming in. Um, but uh, I, I think most of the teachers one would come across today would would be very variable in terms of how much confidence they'd have. And, and they, you know, if people want to take it, they, they've got to, they've got to, they've got to get some background, haven't they? They've, they've got to learn something more about it. Thank you. I'm just, I've skipped over a few that I know that we can answer at the end just by, you know, typing. So I'm, I have seen new people, but I'm, there's just some that I think discussion would be good. So I like this one, talking of the prefrontal cortex, how much of the teenage brain um, is still at play, this development still at play for students in undergraduate years? Well, that's <laughs> such a good question. Yeah, I mean, if you look at the um, graphs, uh, of the um, of the of pruning over this age span, it it does appear that really pruning uh, is continuing into the early twenties, and most people, Sarah Jane Blakemore, um, uh, Evelyn Crone is another one who's written about this. Most um, you know reputable scientists believe that particularly in the prefrontal cortex, maturation is still taking place right up to the uh, early 20s. And that's, that has very big implications, of course, for undergraduate education. I completely agree with you. Um, and uh, I, uh, again, I mean, it's a uh, topic I'm, I'm very interested in. Also, I think other things like sleep, for example, really, really are important for, uh, for that age group. So, yeah, I think, I think you know, we, we, there's so much more we need to uh, we need to explore and we need to learn. Um, and uh, I, I think it's highly probable that the, um, uh, there are many aspects of this process of maturation, particularly I think the connect, uh, connectivity uh, as well, um, are, are still uh, maturing um, uh, past the sort of traditional uh, adolescent years. So it's a very good question. Thank you. Um, Matt has had his hand up very patiently for a while, so I'm going to hand over to Matt to ask you his question directly. Okay. Hi, Matt. Hi, hi, John. Thank you very much for that talk. I'm, my apologies, I was only able to join halfway through, so I hope you haven't already answered this. But when I joined, you were talking about um, these broad principles that are useful for teachers to know, and in particular, executive functions and inhibition. And um, I, I thought it was really exciting uh, Thing to talk about and I was wondering like in your experience how have teachers been able to use that knowledge to inform their kind of practice understanding of children those kind of things Is it, has it been an easy um, story to, to tell that's that's useful for teachers it's certainly very useful for teachers because I, I think most most teachers maybe not the younger ones but most teachers they don't have a sense of what's you know, the cognitive development that's underpinning 
the, the curriculum that they're teaching. Um, and uh, so, um, you know, really learning a bit more about, about working memory, about um, um, inhibitory processes, and, and also the other aspects of, of uh, executive function, like, um, you know, dealing with interference and, uh, and flexibility in problem solving. Um, it, it just gives them a, a new, now, obviously, you know, I, ha I haven't talked to all teachers, um, you know, I, it, my work has primarily been in schools that are interested in local authorities who are keen, have been keen to send uh, teachers uh, to the workshops that I've run. But yes, I mean, teachers do say, I mean, you're right that most of the things that are, uh, that are discussed after workshops tend to be about the behavior of students, i.e. the meltdowns, the uh, consequent, all the things I've mentioned. Um, but some do say, um, you know, I, when I'm, I'm sort of, well, in science curriculum, for example, this is just so helpful because um, I can see how those functions, those executive functions are underpinning what they're doing because teachers think, don't they, that they're, what's, why students are improving is because of their teaching. Um, but what they don't see is that there's an interaction between the curriculum and what's going on in here. And that's the insight, I think, that really does help. Now, I, you know, going back to the previous question, I haven't had any way of, of measuring that, and that, that would be a really exciting project to do with teachers, um, but I haven't done that. Uh, so, uh, it's, you know, you're absolutely right. It's interesting that educational psychologists are now talking a lot about executive functions, quite a lot written in the press or in the EdSight press about executive function and how this has helped them working with teachers. So I think there's a lot more interest in it. And the other thing is, you know, example, Sarah Jane Blakemore's book, Inventing Ourselves, she shows how, you know, you can actually map some of the improvement in executive function on some of the maturational processes in the brain. So um, that's that's also a really interesting area for, I think, future research. Thanks, Matt. Uh, yeah, thank you very much, cheers. Thank you. I think we have time for one more. So I'm gonna go with Sam, who I think is in Kenya. Um, so Sam's question is in the use of classroom questioning during a lesson, what would be the place of infusing neuroscience, neuroscience to handle context-dependent context factors that affect classroom questioning? If I've got that wrong, Sam, do jump in and ask the question directly. But I think it's around context-dependent factors in the classroom and how we address that. That's a tricky question for me. By context-dependent, does that mean what's going on in other words how the students are grouped are they working together are they working um uh, separately um how are they um uh, you know how are they engaging with the um the curriculum is it online is that is that what's meant here um, sam did you want to clarify i don't know whether okay um... it's uh, on a in a face-to-face -face learning environment Okay. Um, yes. Yeah, I think I think in the face-to-face -face learning environment, as I've said, I think there are a number of things that teachers can take from this. I, I'm very keen on the whole issue of rewards and reward processing, and um, uh, you may know there's this uh, sort of group of people who are interested in what's called gamification, um, where um, people are trying to look at the curriculum in the context of gaming. And gaming, of course, is continually providing rewards, which seduces people and keeps them hooked in and so on. Um, so I think the structure of the curriculum and the way that rewards are, 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 are offered is very important, but it's also important in the context of how uh, students get feedback. So, um, uh, you know, if they get feedback a week after they've done a project, um, that, that, that doesn't, that's not particularly rewarding. And one of the things that we've learned about the brain uh, is the teenage brain is that rewards, um, teenagers are very sensitive to rewards, but the rewards need to be quite close to, um, so the feedback needs to be close to the performance. And we also need to think about the, the wider things, you know, some rewards are 
um, uh, are sort of appropriate for one age group, not so appropriate for others and so on. I mean, it, again, it's a big topic, but I would say in face-to-face -face teaching, it's those sorts of things, as well as um, uh, managing the, the the sort of emotional outbursts and the uh, uh, and the um, sort of behaviour that teachers find difficult to um, to deal with. Thank you, John. Thank you so much. We are thank on... you. Thank you very much for your response. Thank you. Sorry, Sam, I didn't mean to talk over you. Um, so we are right at the end. It's five o'clock. So I do want to say thank you so much for a fantastic talk. And we we did have a few questions about how um, people can contact you. So I thought maybe we can make an announcement about that, Matt, if we talk to you afterwards, John. And um, also about different resources. I mean, of course, there's your book. Um, but uh, uh, maybe we can just collate some bits and pieces. It was ju not just the teen years, but also primary years. So maybe as the CEM, we can put together something around that. Um, but thank you so much. Fantastic Absolute talk. Pleasure. And, and please, you know, to everyone here, do contact me. Um, absolutely. John Christopher Coleman at gmail.com. And uh, I'll, I'll do my best to respond. And, you know, I'm I'm... I, you know, I'm, I'm sort of, because I'm semi-retired, I'm, I'm working on I've lots of colleagues, but, you know, I'm very keen to collaborate with people. And I see this as a really exciting um, uh, possibility for, for, I mean, we talked about tonight, um, evaluation, more research. Um, it, neuroscience is not going to go away. We're going to learn an awful lot more in the next few years. Thank you very much, Rebecca and Natasha, um, and Michael too. And uh, thank, thank you. What an you. exciting talk. Thank you so much. Really great. Thank you. And see you again soon, hopefully. Bye. Bye. Is there anything more, Rebecca, you want to pick up or? or um... I was just about to say, actually, oh, here's Michael. Um, that uh, if, would you mind oh, if hi, I- Hi, Michael. <laughs> hi there, John. I've got to apologize. I've been dipping in and out for, for childcare reasons today, uh, <laughs> but uh, I, I wanted to be there at the start, but couldn't quite make it. But thanks so much for coming and uh, talking to the CN. It's been fantastic. And of course, I really enjoyed reading the book. Well, so, uh, very, we very have a long conversation about that. Maybe we should at some point. Well, yeah, I mean, I'm, I mean, I know you're incredibly busy, but I'm very happy to pop in sometime. I mean, I live in London, so if you want a coffee or something, I'd love to. Oh, yeah, that would be great. Yeah, yeah. Right. I know. Well, I, we... I, I feel the, uh, I was going to say the tension between our approaches, but it's more a kind of complementarity, as it were, in that you're yeah. much more at the practical end of things, whereas I feel myself being all kind of a conservative researcher, and I'm all <laughs> kind of wondering about, you know, what does it really mean that there's uh, synaptic pruning in the brain? And this, does that make things worse or is it optimizing or, you know, because because the field of education on neuroscience kind of got its fingers burnt in the 1990s when it got uh, involved in, in early years and uh, the Clinton administration and so forth. So, uh, uh yeah, I think I, sometimes I, I can be too careful and I really appreciate to see what you've done in that short, you know, the engagement in, in uh, the teachers and the parents and uh, the students themselves. Well, let's meet up. and I mean, I totally agree with you. And I think there are, there are so many unanswered questions, so many challenges in this. Um, but I, I also believe it's incredibly worthwhile. And